Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Poison Pen Bookstore. Um, my name is Patrick. It's, uh, I'm not on. Am I on? No. No. Now you're on. Now I'm on. I just need to speak closer to the mic. Anyway, um, it's a real, it's a real uh, privilege to have uh, Andrew Gross back here to the Poison Pen Bookstore uh, to talk about his uh, really remarkable new book, Button Man. Um, for those of you who've read Andrew's two previous books. Saboteur and the One Man, is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've really kind of uh, um, been reborn as a writer of historical you know, crime fiction and just great historical fiction. Um, and this particular book is, uh, you know, as, a, as I guessed, has a very, very deep personal connection to you. Um, first of all, let's give him a nice warm uh, yeah, I mean, we were talking in the back a little bit. It's, uh, for those of you who don't know anything about the book, it's really uh, kind of a love letter to a, a love letter to a lost generation. Let me turn it up. That was good material too. <laughs> you were rolling. I was rolling. There you go. Is that better? Yeah. Uh, anyway. Uh, no, it's just a, a love letter to a lost time and a generation. And you know, as we were talking in the back, you know, you read a book like this, it takes place in the early part of the last century into the 1930s, the Depression, uh, following this, this family. And uh, you, know, you read the trials and tribulations that this generation went through, and, and you, you can't help but feeling, God, we're so soft now. Anyway, can you tell us a little bit about what yeah. inspired the book? Am I on? Do I need it? Do I need it? You probably don't need it. I know. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, well, um, between the years 1880 and 1920, um, some 20 million immigrants came to this country. And Button Man is the story of one of them. And um, it's someone who uh, was the only one in his family um, that was born in the United States, the rest were born in Poland, um, um, who had to start work at 12 years old in order to help support his family, left school after the fifth grade. And by the time he was 19, and so he, he apprenticed in a garment factory. And by the time was, he was 19, he was not only running the factory, but running the whole manufacturing business around the factory, who had to battle the Jewish mob and will talk a bit about the Jewish mob, I hope, um, because it's really an interesting and kind of unique subject that nobody's writing about it, um, had to battle the Jewish mob who had taken over the garment unions for their own illicit gain, um, and then ultimately built the fledgling company he founded into a <coughs> national brand named after his daughter, uh, Leslie Fay, and that man was my grandfather. So I um, wanted to take stories that were that, that I've known since I was a kid, and and you know and memorialize them because they're stories that can't be recreated again. Um, of course, I'm a thriller writer, and I get and, and I'm reminded by St. Martin's that I get paid to be a thriller writer. So I actually had a lot of trouble writing this book, um, or at least getting it getting it approved, um, and my problem was that um, how do I take these rich stories of family that if I didn't give a voice to them would die off in one more generation because my kids, believe me, know nothing, virtually nothing of this. Um, and, then, and then I didn't want to cheapen it by putting it in the form of a thriller so that I could get paid and it could be commercially read. So I really had a lot of back and forth on that. Um, so, um, I, I somehow I managed, I think, to do it because I think you, in, in the end, it's a pretty effective thriller. Al although perhaps it doesn't start out that way; it starts out as a boy to manhood story, um, and quite a bit of it is built off of my my family's history. But I mean, I'm a writer and I'm a fiction writer, so I have the right to embellish and 
certainly in a thriller everything gets embellished a little bit and but but the core of it is who we are as as a family can you talk a little bit about the uh, just kind of the, the key players in this family the, the brothers the twin brothers at the beginning of the book uh, well it starts out with a family tragedy that ends up scarring one of three brothers the, the story is about three brothers they are the Rabishevsky brothers and there's there's Saul, who's the oldest, who is uh, level-headed and smart and bookish, um, and and actually is forced to drop out of accounting school in order when when his when his father dies. There's Morris, who's the real hero of this, um, who is uh, uh, big and powerful and is comfortable using his fists, and and uh, um, he has this relentless drive to succeed, and also this unshakable moral core in his center. And then there's Harry. And even though Harry is older than Morris, he's kind of a ne'er-do-well. He's, he's a very likable guy, but he, he feels that he is responsible for this tragedy that takes place in the opening, in the prologue of the book in 1905. And because of that, he just sort of never, you know, evolves and ends up being seduced into crime. So it's a story of three brothers, um, and 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 the closeness of those brothers, and then ultimately the um, the the, the uh, breaking up of those brothers um, in the dawn of uh, both the garment business and organized crime in New York, um, and then uh, you know the the uh, betrayal, redemption, and then what I most like to write about as a writer, forgiveness. So it really does sort of, you know, take in the whole arc of, um, of human emotion and, and family dynamic. It's funny, that t there's a lot of real kind of classical sort of antecedents here, you know, with this family and these brothers and these themes that you're talking about, you know. Um, you know, not only is it the rise of, uh, the rise of this family and this, this man and this company that he builds uh, out of nothing, but it's also the rise of, you say organized crime and the gangster kind mm -hmm. of era and all these different characters that it ushers in like mm -hmm. uh, Dutch Schultz and uh, Albert Anastasia right and Louis Lepke. Louis Lepke I don't know if these are names that are familiar to people or not but what's interesting about the Jewish mob um, I mean most people sort of think of Jews as people who never rose up because it's colored by perhaps what took place in the Second World War but if you grew up on the Lower East Side, you had two ways out in life. You could go into the garment business because um, um, there, was, there were no barriers to entry, or you went into crime. And um, the, the, the Lower East Side in the uh, you know, early teens to 20s was the most overpopulated area in the world, even more so than Calcutta, India. Um, every tenement apartment would have two to three families in it. Every hallway had the whir of sewing machines and, and the hiss of these sweltering steam irons because the, 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 the housewives, the mothers, after they got their family to bed, had to um, do piecework for the factory in order to add supplement, you know, whatever their, whatever their husband brought in. Um, and and uh, there was also a lot of crime. Literally every corner had gambling scams on it, trying to prey on rubes just off the boat. Um, women who didn't want to uh, sit behind a sewing needle often became prostitutes, literally in back alleys. Um, so crime was a big factor here. And uh, the people um, who grew up there, you know, they're, they're actually there's a line in the book that said, don't let the yarmulkes uh, uh, fool you, they'll still, you know, fleece you blind. And, and uh, you know, if you grew up there, you grew up tough. And, you know, the garment business, which was my family's business, um, this is a story of the roots of that industry. And, uh, you know, it's a fascinating industry because people think of it as the fashion business today, but then it was an all or nothing, hit or miss, you know, sort of enterprise where people literally either made fortunes or went out of business. Um, and, and it was also, as I mentioned, the only way out for a lot of Jews because the German Jews came to this country maybe uh, two, two or three decades before with their wealth. 
and establish themselves here in fields like merchant banking, um, uh, real estate, or, um, or, um, um, or retailing. Um, the Eastern European Jews, who came two decades later, came broke, didn't want to assimilate like the German do Jews did, held on to their languages, whether it was Polish or Russian or Hungarian, you know, held on to um, their whole family cultures. The Germans literally were holding their, uh, their religious services in, um, in English, which was the birth of the reform, I don't know if anyone's Jewish, but the reform, the reform movement in Judaism, I know, I know one person is, but the reform movement in Judaism. Um, it came from the German Jews who wanted to uh, acculturify, you know, and, and as opposed to the Eastern Europeans that wanted to hold on to their identities. So that's sort of the world that all this takes place in. Um, so making your way through it was an arduous thing. You had to battle crime, you had to battle odds against you, and you were totally impoverished. So that's sort of the background that we're dealing with here that my hero, Morris, sets out in his life. And I, I actually kind of call this book um, uh, Great Expectations Meets the Godfather. Um, and Great Expectations because it really is you know, a, a boy to manhood story, you know, for, for a good part of the book, um, set against um, a class struggle and crime. And obviously the Godfather, for its depiction of, 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 of organized crime, it, it, and its uniquely cultural um, a, a basis, and in this case, you know, Jewish organized crime. There's plenty of that out here, too, you know, with, um, with Bugsy Siegel, of mm -hmm. course, and the Vegas mob, and a lot of Phoenix connection, too. Mm -hmm. And um, and also Mickey Cohen, of mm -hmm. course, out in L.A. So we can, we can talk a little about the Jewish mob. You know, no one really writes about the Jewish mob, but mm -hmm. back in the 20s and then 30s, it was a lot bloodier than the Italian mob. As a matter of fact, the Italians used to farm out their dirty work, their hits, to the Jews, um, who turned it into a business, hence the name Murder Incorporated, which was the most feared, um, you know, sort of dominant crime organization in America then. Um, and and uh, so, you know, names like, you know, Abe Rellis or Bugsley Siegel or Dutch Schultz, who plays a big part in this book, or um, Louis Lepke, who actually his name was Louis Buckhalter, but evolved into Louis Lepke, um, who was the number one, you know, killer in New York during this this stage, um, and and then and then this is sort of the world that one of the brothers gets involved in. Although he's not a hardened criminal, he's just sort of someone who hangs on and does errands for them. Um, though that though though it, it it may end you know it may end in a in a, in a complicated way. Um, but, um, and then on top of that, we had Thomas Dewey, in the, and he's a, he plays a big role in the book. And he was a uh, sort of Javert-like prosecutor who was named to get rid of the mob. He ended up running for, for governor of New York. He ended up being governor of New York and ended up running for presidency. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but so there, the book is filled with all these real life people um, sort of like ragtime, I guess, also, and then just sort of seamlessly, I think, goes back and forth between the real and the fiction to, to a large degree. It's funny, you know, I wasn't going to make the comparison with the, uh, you know, the Kennedy brothers, you know, once tempted to, um, but now that you mention it, you know, didn't Bobby Kennedy go after the mob mm -hmm. in the 60s mm -hmm. in a big way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that might not be as uh, mm -hmm. trivial a comparison as I thought, but mm -hmm. um, talking about that, about that era, what we consider the gangster era, really. A lot of it was created by, wouldn't you say, by prohibition um, in the world? You know? Well, the Jewish mob, I think, was created by the dynamics of the Lower East, of the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of them, like Bugsy Siegel, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Dutch Schultz was a big, you know, had a lot of speakeasies and ran right. liquor, you know. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, even, you know, the, the Irish got into that in a, in a big way, certainly. Um, but, but I think the origin for the Jews was literally the sort of nickel and dime kind of, you know, back alley card scams and things of that nature. And if we have time and, you know, haven't totally bored you on this subject, I'd love at the end just to read a few pages that actually show one of those scams and it really gives you a good sense of how the book is done. 
you know, and also protection money because if you were working there and you have to like like my own mm -hmm. character has to go from Cherry Street to Grand Street, he has to like just to get to work as a twelve year old walk across the entire, you know, breadth of the Lower East Side, you couldn't do that without getting rolled. So people have to hire protection money just literally from thugs, from like Irish or Italian th thugs who would allow you to walk through their territories just to get to just to get to work every day. So when you grew up there, you grew up you grew up tough. And, uh, so that this brother Morris, um, he is the one who kind of gets into the garment trade at age twelve. His mother takes him uh, down there to meet the Mr. Kaufman, yeah. who runs the place, and um, and then there's this kind of there are a lot of well, several like kind of silent heroes in the background of this book as, as I read it, and there's this great old kind of master craftsman named Mr. Berg. Beck, we, we established. <laughs> Beck. I couldn't remember the name and, of my uh, own characters. <laughs> he's been at the job for like 50 years, and he, he finally ages out and has to give it up. And uh, this young this young kid, Morris, you know, he's been silently paying attention. And he's a kid. And he's a kid. And why should a why should a 16 year old know how to do the job of a craftsman, a master tailor who's been doing this for 50 years? You know, he's from Hungary, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it just sort of showed. These are some of these are real stories from my life, and and it just sort of showed the incredible brashness and and almost inappropriate confidence that that people had in that era that my grandfather certainly had. Hutzpah. Yeah, Hutzpah. <laughs> well, well, his thing, my grandfather's thing was, you got to have this, and he would snap his fingers, and he goes, and you can't learn it at Harvard, you know, and that was his that was his sort of way of looking at stuff. So, so. A, a lot of the stories in the book were stories that were uh, passed down to me and, and uh, you know, clearly had to do my share of research on this, although a bit of it came naturally, you know, it, it's, it's my, you know, it's what I grew up in. But um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little about one aspect of the, of the research. At some point, I went down to FIT in New York, Fashion Institute of Technology, and I met with uh, someone named Karen Trevet, who was head of the archives there. And I wanted to learn uh, what the industry was like in the 19 teens and 1920s. So the first thing she did was set me up on microfilm for early copies of Women's Wear Daily, and like from the 20s <coughs> and then 30s. And interestingly, I got to see many references to my grandfather there, which was incredible, just that I was seeing him, you know, 40 years before I was born, you know. Um, and, and then, you know, you know, she also gave me a couple of books that these dog-eared old, you know, beaten up books that looked like they hadn't been taken out of the library in decades. Nobody would have been, ever been interested in them. Um, but then she gave me a gift that I'll never forget. Um, she said that many of the founding fathers of the industry made oral tapes as part of the permanent archives here of their beginnings. And she said, would you like to hear your grandfather's? Oh. And I went, would I like to hear my grandfather's? Um, and that's how 30 years after he died, I got to hear my grandfather's voice all over again. And I just played it a little inside, I, I, you know, and 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 because uh, it's on my phone, you know, on my phone. But, you know, he literally just for two and a half hours talked to an interviewer and talked about his life and while while most of these stories I sort of knew he, now I was getting the detail on them now I was really getting what was rich in there you know and and also his own his, his own vernacular because you know he was sort of a marbly mass mouth gruff guy who had this street owned way of talking because he never went past the the, 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 the fifth grade um, interestingly and it is part of the book he ended up Courting this flapper, who you know, um, um, you know, whose family actually her sister went to NYU, and and you know she was going to college, and and you know, you know, with with a little money, um, and just somebody who was totally unattainable to him, and and um, somehow managed to uh, get her to marry him, and together they spent uh, sixty unhappy years. <laughs> So, yeah, I was, was going to ask you about Ruthie, the character in the book. Yeah. She's a great character. And when they meet, 
you know, they're a club, nightclub, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And um, speakeasy. Yeah. Speakeasy. Yeah. And so, and he's with his buddy Irv, mm -hmm. who, who ends up playing an important very role. Very important role. And they meet these girls who are way out of their league. They think, you know, they come from kind of. They're going to Skidmore, they're going to Columbia, yeah. they're going to NYU, and, you know, Morris hasn't gone past the fifth grade, you know. There's, a, there's a great scene where, um, you know, where he, you know, he feels ashamed of his past at, at the beginning. And there's a great scene where they're talking, you know, and they're dating, and they're, you know, Ruthie kind of keeps him at arm's distance <coughs> for a while. You know, we're from two different worlds. We're from, and then there's a great scene where he says, you know what, basically, screw it. I'm, you know, I'm, I am who I am. And well, I'm, she gives I'm, him a book to read, and it's Great Expectations yeah. by Dickens. And there's a good, and there's another good scene where he goes into a bookstore. He's never been in a bookstore yeah. before, and he asks for Great Expectation, and he's looking around in in the on the, on the in the aisles, but it's he's in the history department. He doesn't even know it. You know, he doesn't even know that this is fiction and whatever. And and then uh, to to Ruthie's surprise, he actually reads it, and he sort of talks about why, because she says, "You remind me of Pip," and then. Eventually, he says, I'm nothing like Pip, because Pip had a benefactor, and the only benefactor I've had my whole life was me, you know, and, um, uh, but, you know, like a lot of things, both in the character's life and in, in my personal, uh, you know, in my grandfather's life, he, he went after the unattainable and, and managed to do it. I should also say that my grandfather was someone, and this is the central dynamic of the book, because if there's a bad guy in the book, and there is, it's, it's this um, it's Louis Lepke, Louis Buckholder, Turn Lepke, who they meet as, as, as teenagers, really, and, and have this, this interesting relationship with all the way through as Lepke starts to graduate from, to extortion and then murder. The, the unions took over, uh, excuse me, the, the mob took over the garment unions. And, and what they did then was take the dues and put it in their pocket, and we're talking millions of dollars. It certainly didn't go back to the workers. If you remember the Triangle Factory uh, fire in 1911, the unions actually took a big step forward after that um, because there was such a public outcry again against it. But once the Jewish mob took over, and the you know the Italian mob would had the dock workers, um, the Irish you know mob had had steel had, had you know the construction things of that nature, and and the Jews got the, the garment unions. And then the garment business was the second largest business in New York, uh, New York City. So, so it, not only did they take over from the Jews, but they also took over the chain of supply and the trim markets and things of that nature. And so you could only buy from union-approved resources. And if you didn't, stuff would happen to you. Now, you know, my grandfather would proudly lift his shirt to the day he died and show off the stab wounds that he had courtesy of Lepke's henchman, Jacob Gra. And and in the book, you see how they, what they did. They could they could do something, well, you know, they could come up and just sort of make a mess of your showroom and leave a warning. They could then take a stink bomb and, and, and throw it in your warehouse. It sounds sort of um, um, you know, not so bad, but it would destroy your entire inventory and could put you out of business. Um, the opening chapter, or the second chapter in the book, chapter one, um, shows a friend of Morris's who gets disfigured by them throwing acid on his face because he wouldn't comply. And there is also the occasional person in the book that gets a, gets a ride out a 14-story window down to the street. So these people were brutal, and they killed. And, and it preyed on this industry. So that's kind of the, and they had the dynamic. Local cops and politicians. Everybody in was in their pocket, pocket totally yeah. in their pocket. Yeah. When does this really start to change? Was Dewey. Well, Dewey got rid of them. He, he did yeah. do it. I mean, he, you know, I don't want to give away because some of them are characters exactly how they ended, but, yep. you know, Dewey, Dewey did get the job done, basically. Of course, the mob continued. Uh, the Jewish mob became more of a Meyer Lansky kind of mob, which was, you know, handling the money more than it did, you know, um, more than it was, um, um, you know, the same level of uh, street mob kind of thing that it was during the era that I'm writing about. Well, it's funny because, you know, you write crime novels and um, 
you didn't really have to go very far out of the public record to create a crime novel with this story, right? No, 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 <laughs> I, I didn't. You know, it's, 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 it's really a depiction of an industry, uh, the origin of an industry, um, and it's also a depiction of the origin of organized crime in New York as well. So, yeah, no, I didn't have to go too far, but, you know, my grandfather was one of those people that would always sort of stand up to any adversity. There, there's other stories of him uh, um, coming upon, uh, actually, if someone eventually, you know, and not for the next question or something, but ask what I'm working on now, um, um, I, I'm working on something that involves this kind of thing, but he, he was also known to come upon um, Nazi, Nazi sympathizers who were speaking publicly in New York in the pre-war years and literally like storm up to the podium and pull the guy down, you know. Um, I mean, who does stuff like that, you know? It, it just, you know. I, I remember I, before, well before I was writing, even before, you know, I was in the garment business for some 20 years. Um, so I do have some basis some chops to write about it, I suppose. No, but you just you just slipped that in. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, I worked. I, I worked in various capacities, but I, I worked. Uh, I, I had a restaurant originally. In uh, uh, I, I went out to Denver and I worked for the May Company store there just to get to Denver. And I worked in as an assistant buyer in junior dresses. And then eventually I, I didn't like it, so I opened a restaurant, a stew and soup restaurant in Denver. And, um, and um, um, you know, my grandfather comes out there to visit, and, you know, there was never a moment that I wanted it to be more filled with people than the day that he shows up, right? <laughs> and, of course, it's one of those days where I couldn't scare up a customer, and I was, like, so effing embarrassed and bored about it. And he starts walking through the halls of this mall and going up to people and going, best food in town or your money back, you know, and I'm thinking, like, who does something like that? And then people start to come in, you know? And it's like, you know, you, you, I don't know. You know, if I wanted to, I couldn't do something like that. But he just always had a way of turning, of, of behaving like that and turning them into successful things. So I did, um, long after my grandfather, I mean, you know, Leslie Fay became a, a big diversified company. Uh, and my his son, my uncle, was running it by that time. And it was on the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, so I, I ended up getting an MBA from Columbia, and, uh, and I went into the family business, which I always kind of say the great thing about a family business is that um, it's filled with your family, and you can usually rise to your level of expertise quicker than most in the company. The bad thing about a family business is that it's filled with your own family. <laughs> and in my case, I classed with them quite a bit and managed to find myself my wife is back there, outside of the, outside of the family business, uh, not in the family business, which was a big thing in our family. My mom's name was Leslie Faye, yeah, yeah. And, um, and um, so I ended up doing turnarounds. Uh, I got involved in turnarounds in the ski and tennis business. Um, and and um, like one of them, I, I, I ran uh, head for a while, head ski, head tennis, and uh, a company called Le Coq Sportif, which back in the day was making fancy tennis, we, and we got into golf clothes, and then got involved in a Canadian public ski wear company that uh, didn't turn around at all, hastening my writing career. <laughs> so, but I did spend a lot of time at Leslie Fay and, and uh, managed actually a good share of the business at some point uh, of, of, uh, in the, on the sportswear side of the business. So, you know, I mean, I... I so you were like Harry. Uh, no, exactly. it wasn't like Harry. No, no, no. no well, no. speaking of Harry, who you will meet when you read this book, you know, I found myself really feeling for Harry after a while. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I won't give anything away, but I mean... Uh, well, there's a lot of sadness in their relationship and, and, uh, and how it develops. And like I said, there's betrayal, and then, and then there's, there's uh, forgiveness and, 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 and some tragedy. So, right. you know, I... It, I think it runs the whole gauntlet. Of, of, Absolutely. Yeah. Now, how many of you have read uh, One Man? That was excellent. Excellent Thanks. book. Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about the previous two books, since not, not everybody here was uh, has heard you speak about them. You should and all read can, One Man. That's oh, that's that's, that's like a yeah, yeah. 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 That was kind of that was your first. Uh, outing my first in this historically, historical. yeah, and it's actually built off my wife's 
father's story. There's one. Uh, built off my Which wife's history. father's story, and it's a World War II story that has a Holocaust component. And just very briefly, you know, he was a he was someone who uh, was sent came here um, in <clears throat> six months before the war, and um, when he was a 19 year old, and then never <clears throat> heard the fates, never knew what happened to his family back in Poland. Of course, you know, none of them made it, and he ended up being the only one in his family to survive. Like a lot of uh, um, survivors, he, he 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 would not talk about his life back in Poland. Um, so even my wife had very little clue about her family back there, almost to the point that she knew nothing about his parents uh, and his life before. And then because he was was uh, uh, skilled in several languages, he ended up serving in the OSS in his adopted country during the war, and he wouldn't talk about that either. So I crafted a story that was basically about allied efforts to um, prevent the Germans from, from beating us to the atomic bomb and, and crafted it as if, this, as if this would be the story that if he would tell about his life that, that, he, would, that he would share, that he would tell. And uh, quite a bit of it takes place at Auschwitz. Uh, but it's not a dark book. It's actually a book about heroism. And, uh, and I think... Um, so, you know, but it's, I still do talks in synagogues on it, and it's, you know, over two years since it's been out. And then I did another World War II story um, called The Saboteur. It was here last year on that, which is linked to the one man in that, again, it sort of is about Allied attempts to prevent Germany from getting a bomb, and it's about the heavy water raids in Norway. People may know a little about that. It's, um, and it's a story about that, and it's very much a... Uh, a story of heroism and you know underdogs who be who 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 do something so daring against uh, overwhelming force. So you know I, I like that kind of person, and even Morris is part of that because he stands up to the mob, and um, and when no one else will do it, and ends up sort of working with. Uh, well, I won't say I won't say where it goes because in this kind of story, it's never good to know more than you care to. <laughs> but I like working, you know, I like doing these historical stories, and I, I'm certainly continuing. And uh, is, it, is it an emotional process for you? Sometimes well, these, yes. I mean, these particular ones, because they're so rich in my own family lore, are incredibly emotional for me. And, and I, I hate the minute I get to the end of them. I hate it. Um, I hate turning them over, you know. Although now I really love hearing people's, and hearing their reactions. I was a little concerned. Well, it wasn't an easy. It wasn't an easy book for me to get approval on, because you know they want me to write thrillers at St. Martin's. Why they got me there, and it was it was sort of interesting. How do you turn a story about the garment industry into a thriller? You know, and and I think one of the things they thought, and I might have feared, was that I knew women were going to like was going were going to like this. I didn't. Know, I knew men would like it if they'd read it, but I was a little concerned that men would say, "Well, this is kind of a soft book," you know. I mean, you know, it's one thing to read about World War II and Auschwitz, or you know, or the atomic bomb. It's another thing to read about the garment, the earth business. But it's not soft at all, is it? Right? I mean, it's anything but. Um, and and I'm just really pleased with the reactions I'm getting, even just this first week that it's out, from guys who are writing in. Just you know, it's it's really. You know, it's it's gratifying, but it is emotional for me. Now, you know, uh, you know the historical things. They're difficult because, you know, you guys I'm sure come to a lot of events here and you meet people that have your favorite crime characters and their ongoing characters, and they sit up here and they you love them, you're invested in them, they tell you what's new in them, and you go, oh, you know. That's easy. I don't know how to say it. I mean, I could do that all day long and do two because you don't have to recreate your character. You don't have to usually recreate your setting. You don't have to recreate generally the larger secondary character. You can always carry a couple in that, you know, come up with a new crime and, and a new bad guy and whatever. And I don't want to belittle anybody, but it's really hard when you have to start down and not only do you have to craft a plot and characters, but you have to come up with a moment in history that is so resonant that the outcome of that moment influences 
what we're familiar with and how history goes at that point. You know, I mean, if you know, if if the if if, if the U.S. doesn't beat the, the Germans to the atomic bomb, well, we know what the consequences would have been. You know, certainly London wouldn't exist. You know, um, and the war would have been. They would have. Everyone would have sued for peace, and Germany would control Europe. So you know, you have to sort of find these moments that, and then you have to then craft a credible story around it too. So it's it's challenging, uh, uh, for sure, it's just but thinking, rewarding. Mm -hmm. When you're writing these books that have so much uh, you know, your family background. Does it, in the course, of, I'm not sure if I have a question form, um, but does it, do you come to certain connections in the course of writing about, I don't know, about your own family and things that you might have thought? And um, do you say, wow, that, hmm, this makes me think about these events in a different way that I might not have gotten to if I hadn't tried to write about it? Well, sometimes it's tricky when you get too close to it. This isn't totally answering your question, but it's, you know, I, I have to create characters, and I can't create, it's not, it's not biography. Right. So I'm using a life of someone, like I used my wife's father's life, and like uh, I used my grandfather's, but it's, it's a starting out point for a novel, you know. You know, you don't really want to have this image of your grandfather having sex. It just doesn't <laughs> quite work, you know. So, so it's you, you've got to sort of have a bit of a disbelief in an arm's length, and then just treat them as you know as happens, characters. You don't want to write as it. Ca yeah, yeah, clearly, yeah, right. You know. So, but but so you know, it's almost like when you write a memoir, it's always better if the, if a lot of people have passed away because it's not just that you don't want to offend them. It's also that you, you, you know, these are living people and you're writing about people in a way where one leg is in fiction and one leg is in, is in fact. Um, but someone asked me yesterday in Chicago, what do you think he would have said? And uh, um, if, he, if, if he read this, first of all, he wouldn't have read it, but let's say he listened to the audio or something, you know. And I thought about it in a second and I said, he'd probably say, what are you wasting your time doing this for? Come back in the business. <laughs> but I think he probably would have said, I don't know. I don't know. So what about the uh, the obligatory Hollywood question? Have, have you sold the, especially the one man? I, 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 and, uh, you know what? I hate that question. Sorry. Because, because I have it. I have, you know, I've had a lot of good luck in this industry, but I've had a, a lot of bad luck when it comes to that. And, and the, um, the best thing I could say about the one man, which whenever anybody reads just says, movie, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, is that um, creative artists sent it out to 30 people, and they were every big name in the industry was on that list, and everybody rejected it. Yeah. And I don't know 100% why. A lot of it is that it was fictional, and it wasn't enough based on fact, and today everybody seems to want based on, you know, a true story, blah, 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 you know. Either that or people just didn't want to do. The people who would have done Holocaust stories had just done Holocaust stories, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the people that did it, that we uh, got preoccupied, that, that, that gravitated to these stories, who was a bit preoccupied, was Harvey Weinstein, you know. So, so it didn't sell. And I, and, and, and I think, uh, um, I, I think uh, uh, creative artists were so shocked and embarrassed because they really went out in a big way that they sort of decided um, um, they were going to put me at arm's length. And right now, this book hasn't hasn't sold. And, and this is another. It's a pretty movie centric book. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I can't Once figure upon it out. Time in, right. In, uh, I hear America, it. What's that kind of? I cannot. Saga. You know. So if you're watching out. up there. Film rights are available. Right. Mm -hmm. On this not one. cheap, though. No, I, I, I made a boo-boo. Well, it's not a boo-boo. It was the only game in town for me. But I, um, did anyone see the movie Hacksaw Ridge? It's a good oh, film. Yeah. Yeah. Other than Mel Gibson was the producer of it, the director of it. And the executive producer of Hacksaw Ridge uh, has the rights to uh, the one man. And uh, uh, But it's out of Australia. And... Um, I, I just think ultimately he was the wrong person to give it to because even though that was, I thought, a pretty good movie, um, I, I, I read his script and um, I knew it wasn't going to sell, and it hasn't. So. What other kind of ideas do you have going? Do you have, 
you want to continue writing kind of historical thrillers for a while, or going to mix well, it up? With I music? think everyone knows when someone's up here talking about their book, they're usually halfway through right. you know, the next one. So my next book it takes place in New York also, and at an interesting time. It's pre-World War II, um, so like between 1938 and 1941. And what's particularly interesting is this. The area of New York on the east side, that's 86th Street to like 96th Street, is called Yorkville. Yorkville was historically, a, for 100 years before, a German neighborhood. All of the businesses then, and still a lot of them now, have German names. The restaurants are German. The, the beer halls were German. And because of that, um, pro-Nazi um, uh, rallies and 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 you know uh, were were common in the years leading up to World War II. Now you know Nazis today will start it. You know it took the Holocaust um, for people to sort of look at Nazis with the same you know um, um, you know odiousness, I guess. That but but in the years leading up to the war, half of our State Department <laughs> was pro-Nazi. Charles Lindbergh or second most influential, important person in the country was a Nazi sympathizer. Um, um, so, so it was quite common. Uh, in 1938, February, 22,000 Sig Heiling pro-Nazi sympathizers filled Madison Square Garden and had a huge rally. So, so in this environment, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a story about a young couple who lives moved into a brownstone on the Upper East Side in Yorkville and begins to feel that the very kindly Swiss couple who lives down the hall could be Nazi spies. And so it's really a little bit of a Hitchcockian kind of story as they start putting two and two and two and three and two and four together in terms of these clues. Um, but the truth is, is that, is that this was openly, you know, this it was all open then, you know. so. So it's another interesting, most people really don't appreciate that this was going on. Actually, it's, it's a little reminiscent of life now because, because the Congress then under Roosevelt was, was agrarian and, and was not mm -hmm. as democratic as you might think considering that he won four terms. Um, and they were isolationist. And then there were interventionists, but the interventionists were urban. So you had the same clash of cultures then that you have now between the rural and the urban, uh, trying to get us into the war to protect Britain, to rescue Britain, and the agrarians, the isolationists, who said, this is Europe's war, not us. We don't want any involvement. And it took Pearl Harbor to get us in the war. You know, so, so that's what I'm working on. Wow, that's awesome. Anybody have any questions? I'd like to ask. Where, where was the business? Because I worked at the Godwin Center. Where was the business? Yeah. I worked yeah. on Broadway. Every every building on Broadway. I mean, I just so that you tell I you know. I worked on 1400. Yeah, well, I, I mean, the original business was in 1400, <laughs> but I've worked, I've worked in 1400, 1407, 1410, 14, um, uh, 12, right. um, you know, so. You know, it was in, we had 36 divisions when, when it closed. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of different businesses. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, they, I thought they were such good businessmen. You don't think them as mafia. Well, they weren't mafia. Mm -hmm. I don't, I think you, I gave you the wrong impression. <laughs> they, they weren't, um, they you weren't. You had to deal with mafia. I mean, but you weren't in the industry yeah. when this was going on. So this, this, before. yeah, I mean, come by the, by 1957, Leslie Fay was 100% a union company. Mm -hmm. I mean, things were radically different then. Yeah. Is this where the Strand is, roughly? In that no, area? Strand is farther south. Mm -hmm. Farther yeah. south. Okay. By the way, there is no garment business and no garment in, in, in center no, anymore. anymore. Yeah. It's my son, who is who works for a real estate company, said one day, "Come on down, have, have lunch with me." Yeah, you've never done it. You've never been up to our office. So I said, "Sure." Where is it? He said, "14, 14 11 Broadway." I said. Give me a break. That's a clothing building. He goes, Dad, you know, get with it. it. Hasn't been a clothing company in there in 15 years. So, you know, when I was in the business, it was 100% clothing in there. Yeah, it's, it's like North, yeah, it's kind of more Koreatown now. You know? yeah. Yeah. Oh, you said that you might read for us. Oh, yeah.
I mean, I will if you 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 want. It's a, it's a cool sure. chapter. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll do that. I'll do that. Then I'll tell you. I think I can. I read. You can hear me, right? Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Don't go far without them. I know, right? Let me find this. Uh, Um, okay, so just to set the stage, Morris is 12 years old, and he's uh, he's working on Grand Street, which is the other side of the Lower East Side, and it's payday, and he's got money in his pocket, and it's always a bit of a challenge to navigate his way back to Cherry Street, where he lives, without running into certain types. So he thought it wiser. He, he, he sees this group of people behind him that look a little threatening. So he thought it wiser to duck through an alley off of Broom, which led to Delancey and the safety of crowds. Mm -hmm. But the alley was narrow and unlit, and ahead Morris heard voices, peals of exultation mixed with groans of frustration. He saw a group of men sitting on fruit boxes with two young toughs overseeing a card game. The con men were older, one short in a suit, black coat, and Hamburg, the other in ragtag clothes with a flat wool cap, twice his size. Morris knew how to handle himself, but not against thugs like these. They looked like the real thing. He looked behind and saw the band of street toughs congregating at an alley entrance, so he thought the safer course was to continue on rather than turn back. He figured if these guys gave him any trouble, he could always make a dash for the other side. As he approached the card game, one of the con men caught sight of him, and came up to him with a cocky smirk. He was dressed in an ill-fitting black coat and a black hat, tilted slightly to the side, though he really wasn't a man at all, more of a youth trying to look like one, dressed all dapper, chubby-cheeked, with a dimpled chin. Morris pegged him as no older than 17. He was shorter than Morris, but not short on boldness, blocking Morris's way. Want to get through? It'll cost you, kid, a buck for protection, the tough said. His crony, the slope-shouldered bruiser in the tweed cap, looked over too. I don't need protection, Morris replied. Hear that, Jacob? The one in the suit sniffed. The young man says he doesn't need protection. Everyone needs protection, kid. It's a rough world to navigate out there. The tough's large companion sauntered over from the card game. That's a pretty nice coat you got there, fella. It's not the coat, but what's inside it that I'm interested in, Jacob. Friday's payday, isn't it, the tough, in the, the tough in the suit said to Morris in Yiddish. You got a job, kid? I see you got a nice bag of vegetables there to take home to Mama. I work, Morris folded the bag closed, and what's in the bag ain't your business, he answered. Delancey, with its crowds, was only 50 yards ahead, but getting past these thugs, especially the ox, would be a challenge. But in the end, Morris reasoned there was enough money on the fruit boxes that the two thugs would have to remain with their card game. Still, the bruiser sauntered out, also blocking Morris's way. Why don't you let me see what's in the bag, kid? The tough in the Hamburg and coat grinned. He had a flat nose like it had been broken more than once in a fight and a chummy smile, though the invitation was anything but friendly. First the bag, Morris knew, then his pockets. After the three-card Monty fiasco, a few months before, he had lost all of his week's pay because he thought he could, he could he sort of understood how it was, and he, and he didn't. Uh, after the three-card money fiasco, he wasn't about to come home empty-handed again, no matter what he had to do. Take a hike, Morris tried to walk on past. Take a hike. Hear that, Jacob? What does it make you think when a little pisher like this tells you to take a hike? It makes me think we ought to hold the brat upside down by the ankles and see what falls out, his large partner said. It makes me think... We might have been willing to let him pass, the one in the suit said, but now things have changed. What do you say you try your luck at the game, kid? You got some money on you, right? Three bucks get you a seat. Maybe you win big and take home a wad to mama, or maybe you leave it here. What do you say? I say I don't like the odds, Morris said, again trying to take a step around him, but the tough scampered ahead of him again and blocked his way. Our little friend here is quite the handicapper, Jacob. You're right on the odds, kid. 
but still better odds than say fighting me I told you it'll cost you a buck to pass the guy wasn't so big but he had a wide cocky smirk on his face and a willing gleam in his eye and Morris knew this likely wouldn't be the first time he'd used his fists but he was determined to keep his money he rolled up the bag of vegetables and looked back at him all right you want to fight so bad I'll fight you you will, will you? The tough grinned and glanced at his friend with an amused chortle. Hear that, Jacob? Our friend here says he'll fight me to get by. He met Morris's gaze, a little shorter than he was, but cocky as a peacock. He rolled up his sleeves as if preparing. You may be, the larger friend said with a dull shrug, but I bet not me. The tough's cohort was larger than any of them, plus four or five years older. He would surely be the biggest person Morris had ever scuffled with. But Morris looked at him dead on. If I have to, I'll fight you too. The one in the suit laughed. Ha, Jacob, I love this kid, but he clearly doesn't have much between the ears. Still, a whole lot of moxie. I'll hand you that, pal. The tough put his cigarette down on one of the crate boxes and, and removed his hat and coat. So listen, I make a rule for you, kid. You take me, you're free to pass. I take you, we see what's in your pockets. Truth is, he handed his oversized friend his coat. Since I got back from reform school, I haven't had a good row. Isn't that right, Jacob? Let me have a shot at him, his companion said. We'll find out what he's got on him. Take it easy, my large friend, the tough said. As you know, Jacob, I prefer to settle my own scores. It won't take but a second. Ready? The tough loosened his tie. He stepped out in front of Morris, cracking his knuckles on both hands. He was smaller than Morris in frame, but clearly older, and had already spent time been sent upstate, which meant he knew what he was doing, and he seemed to relish the fight. He put up his fists, and his nod meant business. But you ought to know, kid, when I do fight, I fight to win. Morris felt his heart begin to pick up. He didn't know where this was heading, probably a busted nose at the least, or worse, the loss of a week's pay. He began to think that maybe paying the buck was the wiser choice after all, but there didn't seem any way out of it now. He put down the bag and took off his coat as well. Come on, kid, the tough wink bobbing behind his fists. Let's see what you got. Morris put up his fist too and said, I ain't no kid. That's so? All right, then here's your chance to prove it. The guy lunged, then jabbed at Morris, probing his defenses. Morris thought if all else fails, he could simply charge the guy and bowl him over and keep on running. A bag of onions and turnips wasn't worth losing a week's pay over. But the idea of running didn't sit well with him. Didn't sit well with him. He heard stories of what went on in these upstate, upstate schools. The guy had likely been in more scraps than Morris had been in Temple. But here they were, circling, dodging, the tough with a determined grin on his face. No backing down now. One of the card players spun around. Listen, you shitheels, I didn't put my money down to watch you duke it out with some 12-year-old with nothing at stake. Deal the cards. I don't have all day. The tough circle dodging behind his fists. Relax. This won't take but a minute. He lunged again, and Morris sidestepped him and spun, across his lower, spun him across his lower leg to the ground. The guy jumped back up to his feet, chastened and a bit surprised. He gave a glance to his behemoth friend, then back to Morris. Not your first tussle, huh, pal? Morris said, look, I just want to get by, that's all. Too late for that, I'm afraid. The tough brushed the dust off his pants. Okay, let's go. He lunged again with a, with a right this time. Morris took a hard shot to his face. He felt blood ooze out his nose. He wrapped his opponents in a clench, and they struggled, the guy grabbing and twisting and trying to elbow Morris below the belt. Morris edged his weight against him and wrestled him to the ground. Red-faced, the guy hopped back up to his feet. This time, any trace of liberty had disappeared from his eyes. You want me to cut in? Say when, his companion chuckled, an edge of mockery in his offer. No, I got it, Jacob. I got it just fine. The tough reached inside his pocket and came back out with something gleaming. A knife. Maybe I didn't get my point across, kid. His smile had changed, ire flashing in it now. You want to take me on? We play for keeps. He lowered into a crouch, thrusting his blade towards Morris's face. Morris took a step backwards, his heart accelerating with real worry now. 
He'd been in plenty of scraps, but never had a knife drawn on him before. Come on, the tough said, beckoning Morris on. You want to fight so bad? I'm here to give you one. He circled with a benevolent smirk on his face, a smirk that said he was prepared to do anything. How about I cut that Russian nose of yours down to size, just to show you? The tough's partner had circled behind Morris, removing any escape. If there had to be blood, then there would be blood, Morris accepted. He was in this far. He wasn't giving up his hard-earned money now. The knife, the tough, jabbed the blade. Morris dodged backwards and put up his hand. The knife nicked him, slicing a red line of blood on his wrist. The tough grins. Fun, fun's over, huh? Come on, let's go. Then the card player turned around and chuffed again. I said, deal, smart guy, or I'll take my winnings and leave. I didn't come here to get the cops called on us. Hey, another of the players grumbled. You leave now, you leave with my money. You'll have to go through me. I thought this game had rules. The tough looked at them and stopped. Gentlemen, gentlemen, it's just a little free entertainment, that's all. He gave Morris a wink and brushed himself off. On second thought, Jacob, I think the numbers say this time we let the kid go. We'll catch up to him another day. He folded the knife back into his pocket and picked up his hat with a smile that's red. There's unfinished business between us. It's your lucky day, kid, but I give you credit. You're no mama's boy, much as I thought. It occurs to me we can use a tough little mocker like you. What do you say? Plenty of opportunity out here. You want to put a little guilt in your pocket? I already have a job, Morris said. He already has a job. Hear that, Jacob? He doesn't want to pal around with the likes of us. Suit yourself, then. The tough bent down and picked up what remained of his cigarette off the fruit box. So what's your name, anyway? Morris Robb, Morris adjusted his sweater. Yours? Mine? The street tough put his hat back on. Lewis Buckholder, that's my name. And you remember it, kid, if you're smart. Not many people get to turn Lewis Buckholder down. You're already ahead of the game. He looked at him and adjusted the tilt of his cap to just the right angle. So Morris, Morris bent down and reached for his bag of vegetables. Yeah? The tough reared back and took a swing, catching Morris flush in the jaw. He felt a tooth fly out of his mouth and he stumbled backwards a step and went down to one knee, his lip bloody. Okay, Morris, Rob, we'll be seeing you around then, he said in Yiddish. Enjoy those onions. Morris stood up, rubbing his jaw. He spit out a mouthful of blood. Be seeing you too. But it was years before Morris did see him again. By then, Morris was grown, and Lewis Buckholder was no longer just running card games in some back alley. So... Yeah. Tammy, I know you had a question. Well, as I'm sitting here and you're discussing your grandfather, it occurred to me that your grandfather probably knew my great-grandfather, because my great-grandfather had a smoke stand right there. I think we've talked about this when we were in New York. Um, we, he had a smoke stand right there at the entrance of the Staten Island Ferry, and he would go back and forth. And with his being Jewish, he um, spent a lot of time on the Lower East Side, uh -huh. my grandmother used to go to Cats. Cats quite a bit, uh -huh. um, and so my grand, my great grandpa used to go to Cats quite a bit as well. So it occurred to me as we're sitting here and you're telling me this, they probably knew we'll each other. We'll never know. I know, but they <laughs> probably knew each other because my grandpa had a newsstand, but he also was the um, I forget what do you what do you call like a what do you call people who make cigars? Tobacconist. Yes, thank yeah. you. My great grandpa was oh, tobacconist. Cool. He was, he lived, even though he lived on Staten Island, he had a shop there, but he also brought his um, cigars over and sold them every day to people as they were coming off the well, that's cool. and going back and forth. So they probably knew You don't know. Well, there was a tobacconist in 1400 Broadway Matt named Matt Sherman. Yeah. And one of my, and, it, and, and at some point he sort of branded himself and there were other right. Nat Sherman franchises around. But one of my earliest memories is sitting on Nat Sherman's knee, you know, at, at my grandfather's, you know, in the lobby of uh, the office. So, so my great cigarettes. Yeah. 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 My great grandfather's one was Abraham Fish. Abraham Fish. That's a good name. Next next time he's yeah. in. He used to sell the Murad cigarettes, the Turkish Murad cigarettes, the newspapers, magazines. He had penny palms. My mom told me she remembers having. Penny gums and the jawbreakers and something else. 
And then mm-hmm. like when my talked to my grandmother about it, my grandmother confirmed the story. So it was pretty cool. Good memory. They probably knew each other. How cool is that? <laughs> yes. What did you find in researching that surprised you about your family? It's a good question, and I don't have. I, I'm not sure. Well, I guess what surprised me in that sense was just how. I mean, you know, I went back to to these issues of women's wear, literally back to like 1922. My grandfather would have been just 20 years old, and I caught all these references to him. And I was just paging through pages. I mean, it wasn't like I could plug in Pomerantz and find it. So I was just like quickly reading them. And I would see, you know, mention of Fred P. Pomerantz, but then his firm, I, I was called Silverthorn. I mean, you know, he'd started his own firm in 20 or 21. So, you know, just the fact that he was a character, uh, you know, even back then as, as a kid, you know, my kids were still in college. He was making his way and making a name for himself, you know, in the, in the business. When yes. you found the recordings, did your brother know that he that her father had made those recordings? Um, it's it, it, my mom sadly is she's around but she's cognitively uh, not around mm-hmm. so she oh, she so doesn't just know. recently found out about that so yeah yeah it, yeah, oh. yeah so yeah. I actually played it for her once and she nothing, she, nothing. Oh. yeah she didn't mm-hmm. uh, respond really mm-hmm. there you know mm-hmm. so. mm-hmm. anything else anyone else one more well thank you you're one minute yes how, how could you come up with a character like the lead guy in that one? I mean, that was... Nathan? Yeah. That was so phenomenal to me. Well, because he was a hero who succeeded by guile, you know, and not by brawn or not, you know, and, and, and he had a lot to make up for, you know. He, in his own mind, felt that he had um, betrayed and abandoned his family and left yeah. them to die. So that's a, a powerful emotion to carry with you. And my, my father-in-law was someone who uh, we, we could carry this sadness with him. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you this quickly. I mean, I, I don't want to take up that much more time, but quickly. He carried this sadness with him all, all the time that I knew him, you know. And no one, none of us could figure out what the sadness is because no one knew enough about it. And, 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 and he wouldn't talk about it. But he, he just, he, he had this gravity, this, this weight. Um, after he died, um, um, uh, my wife and was going through uh, his his uh, uh, his belongings and his dresser and found this incredible thing, and it was a cache of letters that were written in Polish that were from his mother, her grandmother, to him in the first year that he was here. And no one had ever seen them before. Mm-hmm. And we have a, co- a, 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 a neighbor of ours uh, is Polish in New York. So we were having a memorial um, for him at our place in Florida. And so we quickly sent them up um, to uh, Joanna. And she translated them and sent them right back down. And it was indeed from his mother. And it showed a, a, a funny, sort of worldly, um, a, a really interesting person which was the first glimpse that my wife really ever had into her, her maternal her paternal grandmother, you know. When she died in the concentration camp? Well, no one knew, no one knows where they perished, you know. But what she was writing about was, Nathan, why do we not hear from you? Why are you not writing us? How is life in America? Are you okay? You know, please let us know how you are. It was all of this. And what was clear is that what Nathan was writing back was never being delivered. Mm-hmm. And so his family died not knowing if he got these letters, if he loved them, if he, you know, not knowing anything about him. And that's a very profound sadness to carry with you. And, and we at least sort of identified, I think, what was in his heart, you know, that he, that, that you know, affected him. So, One heck of a story. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. I, 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 Thanks so much, everybody. You all know the drill. If you would, uh, hold up your chair and put it against the right over there. Just put it against the wall. We don't know the drills. <laughs>
<laughs> you don't know the drill. Jack him up against the wall. Where's Barb off to now, Pat? She is 